Okay, uh, I've got my glasses on, which means it's question time. Now, I know it's been a while since we've answered questions, but when I'm touring, it's really tough to answer questions because, to, I gotta explain this to you, the most important thing to me is the shows. So, when I have a day off, I am so disciplined that I don't talk. So you have to understand that because really what counts is the people that bought the ticket and paid the money to get that show. And it's much more important than answering questions. But now, I don't have a show to Wednesday, and I'm actually doing a pilot for a, um, with Malcolm McDowell and Parker Posey and somebody else for uh, I'm playing a potato um, for an age group of three to six, and they're flat like South Park, which is very cool, which I think is fantastic. So now I'm going to answer some questions. And the first question, that's why I'm wearing my glasses so I can read. What was the reason for you to cut your hair in the 90s? Was it style related or be sick long hair? There was two reasons. One, yes, I was sick of the long hair because it just got in my way. But the real reason that I cut my hair was my friend Dennis Quaid called me up and said, I want you to be play my best friend in a movie, Everything That Rises. And I said, oh, Dennis, I'd love to. He said, I'm sending you the script. So he sent me the script. Now, the script took place in Montana in the early 60s. Now, I'm sorry. But a cowboy in Montana in the early 60s didn't have long hair. So I cut my hair. And the lady who cut my hair is a friend of mine named Catherine Furness. A very lovely girl. And she was freaking out that she cut my hair. And it took her hours to actually cut my hair. Now here's the funny thing. When I showed up on the movie set and I had short hair, Dennis said to me, what happened to your hair? And I said, well, Dennis, the script was the 60s on Montana. He goes, oh, I've updated it to be modern day. And he said, oh, no, I didn't want you to cut your hair. And I said, well, it's cut now, so deal with it. But I'm really happy I did. I was, because when I was doing the shows, and I was, I sweat a lot. It would fly in my face, and I'm getting all eyes. And have you ever had an eyelash in your eye, or hair in your eye? It, like, drives you nuts. And so, I've cut my hair, and uh, I'm really happy I did. And I didn't make a big deal out of it like some other people who cut their hair. Who, well, I will remain, I almost said his name, but I'll remain nameless. That's why I cut my hair. All right, question two. Okay, none of your songs are on Guitar Hero. Let me tell you why. <laughs> because any song on Bad Out of Hell Unless you're a, magi a magician, not a magician, a musician, you have no idea how complicated the chord changes are. Jim Steinman writes, that there's no logical progression to it. It takes a very long time to learn stuff, even for pros that have been doing it for years to learn Bad Out of Hell, to learn any of the stuff. And um, just to give you a heads up, 
next year's tour, and we are touring next year, 2012, um, uh, what we're going to do is in two acts. The first act will be songs from Hell in a Handbasket, a couple of songs from Hankel Teddy Bear. Uh, we're actually doing a song from Lima Forest Stop called Execution Day, I think. Don't hold me to that. Paul loves that song. So do I. Written by Dick Wagner, uh, who wrote with Alice Cooper, all those great songs. Second half is going to be, and this is going to be true, Bat Out of Hell in order. Bat Out of Hell took the words, having the made all ripped up, two out of three, Paradise Midnight were light, and for crying out loud. That will be the second act of that tour. And then we're going to come up with an encore. And the encore has got to be unbelievable. I don't know what that is right now, but it's got to be unbelievable. But that's what's going on. But that's why none of the songs are gr on Guitar Hero, because it, 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 they're more complicated than anything you could possibly imagine. What was it like working with Steve Martin on Leave of Faith? Um, I can never ever compliment Steve Martin enough. Steve Martin is one of the most intelligent people you will ever meet in your entire life. And uh, about four weeks into the shoot, Steve Martin's assistant came over to me and said, Steve really loves you. And I went, he does? He goes, yeah. And Steve would always, a lot of times, your A-list stars will have their lunch delivered to their trailer and not sit in the lunchroom with the crew. But Steve always sat in the lunchroom with the crew. But he would sit by himself. Well, at one point, Steve's assistant came to me, and Steve said, he said, Steve would like for you to have lunch with him. And I went, okay. So I went down with Steve, and after that, we were on the set for about five months. I sat with Steve every day at lunch. We had the most remarkable conversations. Steve's hearing is really, really sensitive. So I went to him and played anything for love before anyone else heard it. Steve was the first person to ever hear the song, Anything for Love. And I had to turn it so low, and I'm deaf as a post, I couldn't hear it. But he, it was like amplified through a Marshall. And it finished and he said, that is one of the most remarkable songs I've ever heard in my entire life. And I said, you actually heard that? And he went, yeah. And I gave him a present. Uh, at the end of the shoot, I gave him a keychain, a plastic keychain that said, to Steve, love meat. And he said to me, I will hang on to this forever. Steve Martin is a number one in my book. I love that guy to death. And you have no idea, one of the smartest people you will ever meet in your entire life. Uh, next question, will you ever do Tiny Dancer? Not a prayer. That song belongs to Elton and Elton only. In the video, Los Angeles, Mr. Fire wore red shoes to match his red suit. Did Mr. Blue wear blue shoes to match his blue suit? The answer is yes. They just didn't get a shot of him. 
But yes, I have red shoes and blue shoes. Um, your Westies are adorable. Do they ever tour with you? Um, when we first had our Westie, Angus, Angus, we have two names, Angus and McKenna. They're Scottish, Scottish names, good Scottish names. Um, Angus toured with us, but since we got two, no, they don't tour with us because they, uh, they're they older now and we just moved and they're just getting over the move and they and it's been about six weeks. So, but when we took Angus on tour as a puppy, oh, uh, he was, he, was the, he owned the tour bus. The tour bus belonged to Angus. Did I know that Sean Payton, a head coach in the New Orleans Saints, choose juicy fruit as well? No, I didn't. But now that I do, you know what? If we were gay, we'd probably be married. Have you ever considered doing an acoustic album? Uh, just like piano and acoustic guitar. Yeah, but um, we're actually, we finished Hell in a Handbasket, which actually, the Hank Gould Teddy Bear album is so special to me. I'm so much in love with Hank Gould Teddy Bear. But everybody that is hearing Hell in the Handbasket is saying to me that Hell in the Handbasket is a better album than Hank Gold Teddy Bear. Now, but I'm so close to it, we did it so fast that I, I'm not going to say that. All I know is that the opening song called All of Me is one of my most favorite songs I've ever recorded ever. And there's a third song on the album called The Giving Tree, which is absolutely phenomenal. And Patty and I do a song, a duet together, called, uh, uh, written by Sean McConnell, called Our Love and Our Souls. Oh, Our Love and Our Souls. Uh, and, uh, and you've seen me cry on Celebrity Apprentice. Every time that I listen to that song, and I li and I listen to the record. If I listen to the record a lot, it means I like it. And I've listened to Hell in a Handbasket a lot. Every time I hear our love in our souls, I cry. It's like ridiculous. I'm so stupidly emotional. And I'm doing Piers Morgan. I'm doing an interview with Piers Morgan on what's the date, Kelly? Uh, the 18th. 18th? Yeah. I'm going on Piers Morgan on the 18th, and he's gonna he's gonna ask me about crying, and I can't wait. And and there's some stuff they didn't show you on Celebrity Apprentice, because he asked me, how bad do you want to win in Celebrity Apprentice? And I looked at him, I said, more than you did. And he said, I don't think so. They didn't show that. But I'm going to bring it up. Okay. I have to know. This is a question. I have to know, do you sing in the shower? Yes. The two, I sing two songs in the shower. I sing the Star Spangled Banner, which is one of the hardest songs in the world to sing. And I always, because... I have such a mental block against anything for love. I will always, in the shower, sing the beginning of anything for love. So I sing the Star Spangled Banner and anything for love. Those is, and every once in a while, I sing. Uh, 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 wake up, little Susie. Oh, what we gonna tell your mama? What we gonna tell you about? Oh, 
Are we going to tell your friends when they say, Ooh la la, we got little Susie. I sing that. To get you on, I always sing the big pop. Shit to the least, and a pretty face, and a pony tape, and a down. I love the big popper. Um, uh, what is your favorite alcohol drink? Okay, I don't drink very much, but when I do, it's only ever tequila, and it is Don Julio. Um, but, um, this reminds me. Um, all these stories went around. Yes, I did faint in Pittsburgh. Passed right out. But it wasn't doing anything for love. And it wasn't for 10 minutes. It was about two minutes. And I was having terrible, terrible asthma. And I thought I was going down and living on the outside. And I went back to John Michelli before we started Los Angeles Loser. And John said, my face was so white. And I said to him, I think I'm going to pass out. So we got to Los Angeles Loser and I said, okay, I, I can pull back a little bit. And I'll wait for Patty to come up. And I'll kind of let Patty take it. And I... I'm looking at Patty, the next thing you know, I'm gone. And I guess I'm out for like two minutes. And I wake up, and I go, where are we? And somebody goes, we're in Pittsburgh. And I said, I know that. Where were we in the show? And they said, you're getting ready to start, took the words. I said, and they're going, oh, we can't finish, we can't finish. I said, and the paramedics are going, you gotta come on. I'm going, are you out of your mind? We got a show. I turn to Justin, the piano player, I go, Star took the words. Ah, I went, no, nah, ain't coming off. Baby, the only time I came off, I came off stage twice. Once when I had the cyst on my vocal cords in, uh, starts with an N, Newcastle, and I had no idea what was wrong, but I had a cyst, the same thing that Steven Tyler, Rod Stewart, Elton had, a whole bunch of people had, it's just that I got caught on stage with it, and the other time is when I had Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome, and uh, which is not really a heart condition, it's a I found out that it's a thing that marathon runners and the cath the cathlon athletes get. And my heart rate was up to 273 beats a minute. And just to let you know, at 300 beats a minute, your heart will explode. So they, I wanted to go back on. And they said, you, you're out of your mind. And they wouldn't let me back on. We were at Wembley. So they rushed me to the hospital. And they put me in a cardiac care unit. The cardiac care unit almost killed me. I would go and get me out of here. There was people undoing their monitors. And these loud sirens were going on. I couldn't get any sleep. I said, Get me out of here. So they put me on a monitor, sent me back to the hotel where I could go to sleep. We did the surgery over in St. John's Woods Hospital. I don't remember the name of it. And I've been fine. Yes, I have asthma. But since 1977, I've had oxygen. And it's no big deal. Some nights I need it. I would say... 
80% of the nights, I don't need it at all. 20% of the nights, I need it. There you go. All right, next question. What was it like working with Frank Varian? Frank Varian is a genius. And, uh, I mean, you got to figure out that he put together Boney M, Rivers of Babylon, which is one of the biggest songs in history. And then it was responsible for those two guys. What were their names? But they lip synced. They didn't actually oh, sing. Billy Vanilli. Billy Vanilli. And one of them killed themselves, which was a shame. But Frank Farian is a really good producer. And he is really, really, really good. The problem I had with Frank is we made one album. I left. He remixed it. That was my problem with Frank. But if you ask me, do I love Frank Farian? Yes. Do I love his wife? Yes. Do I think he's a great producer? Absolutely. Would I work with Frank again? Yes, I would. But I would take the album with me when I left. How many more albums do you see in your future? Well, right now, we finished Hell in a Handbasket. I'm not going to tell you the title of the next album. Um, but we have eight songs to another record, and we have a complete Christmas record ready to go. Um, called, we try to put hell in the title, because what's happened is that we did Hey Cool Teddy Bear. And they tried to get me to call it Bad Out of Hell 4, and I said no. And so I finally figured out that if it doesn't have hell in this title, nobody wants to know about it. So from now on, every album is going to have hell in its title, except for the Christmas record. And we couldn't put hell in the title, so we're calling it Hot Holidays. Now there is a story going around, and it says Garth Brooks and Reba McIntyre set to do Meat Loves Out, Meat Loves Thing. I had a reporter come up to me after he saw me talking to Garth, who's a friend of mine. And all I said to Garth was, Garth, I want to call you on the phone. I want to talk to you. And I said, I want to talk to you and Trisha. Because they're man and wife. And, he, and Garth says, well, let me give me my number. And I said, we got the same management. And the reporter said, what were you going to... And it was stupid me. He said, I saw you talking to Garth. I said, yeah, I'm going to call Garth and ask him to sing on the Christmas record. But I didn't tell Garth that yet. And now all these stories are going around. Garth said, Garth and Reba. And I talked to Reba and I talked to Garth and I said, I want to call you. Because I, I want to do, I'm going to get Stoney and Sean Murphy, two with Patty, two with Justin. I'm going to get John Rich to sing. I want to get... Um, Garth to sing with me, I'm going to get Trisha to sing with me, and I'm going to get Reba, and I'm sure they will, but the stories are not true, because I haven't officially asked him yet, but I think when I do, because Garth is so real, that's the country people, folks, Brad Paisley, Travis Tripp, Garth, Trisha, Reba, Carrie, those country people are so real, so real, much more real than any of the rock people. They're just so down to earth, and I love them so much. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't go country, but you know what? I'm glad I went with Jim Steinman, because Jim Steinman is my brother, and I love him more than you will ever know. And I know that Jim and I We'll work together again. I know it for a fact. We, he doesn't know it, but I do. Okay.
I got a question. Do you guys gamble while in Atlantic City? No. Don't go. Nah. I can't go down there. Um, I, I have before, but since they tricked me into doing Celebrity Apprentice, and it really was a trick, uh, because I got a phone call right as I was, the, my little cell phone ring, as they were knocking him, I was shooting a movie in South Carolina. Um, I don't remember the name of the movie now. And I picked up the phone, and they said, they want, they've asked me to do Celebrity Apprentice every year, and I've said no. They've asked me to do Dancing with the Stars, I've said no. They've asked me to do help on the celebrity, get me out of here. I said, are you out of your mind? They just, they offered me so much money to go over to England to do celebrity big brother. I, I just giggled. Because 99.9% .9 of the people, when they offer you that much money, would do it. I have never done anything for the money in my life. And I never will. The most important thing to me is the artistic integrity of the moment, not the money. Everybody else will do everything for money. Listen, I've turned down movies for so much money that agents have quit me because they go, are you out of your mind? Do you know how much money that is? I go, yeah, but I don't want to be a prop. I just turned down a show in Australia for a ridiculous amount of money. Because we're shooting a DVD in Sydney. And the most important thing to me is that in Australia, Helen Handbassett is coming out first there. We're shooting a DVD. The DVD is important. And it's much more important than whatever. Look, honestly, if they would offer me ten million dollars, I would have taken it. Okay, but they didn't offer me that much. So, my okay. Everybody's a whore. Ten million is my price. Uh,